Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk on custom code checks. So, as been said, yeah, I work in Red Hat, so I'm a software engineer. And uh, I work in a team who does the CI stuff, uh, kind of release management. And uh, I'm a DevOps advocate, and we are kind of promoting DevOps culture. And as you would guess, that implies a lot of automation. And the Python is our primary language. And uh, by the way, there was a Lago talk about the framework we developed. I know there are just a few places on the workshop left. So you have a last chance to subscribe, so just do it. And uh, as you noted, I just enjoy doing the checks, <laughs> especially when they are automated. Uh, Anybody here thinking that checking source code is not a good idea? Okay, I barely can see any hands raised. So that's great. So this talk assumes that we all believe in like intrinsically think that checking source code is a good idea. Uh, we do it manually, right, through the code reviews, but uh, it's also possible to do it automatically, and I guess a lot of you do it. And uh, why, why it makes sense to do it automatically? Well, just computers are suitable for boring work. And if they can do it instead of you, that, that's nice, right? You can go drink coffee, tea, whatever you like. And another important point that they can do it without you. So you don't need to be present. You can just uh, send some instruction to your friend, and he will run those checks, and they will do it the same as you would do it. So it's produces some reproducibility. So if it's done properly, there are no complaints. It works for me or it doesn't work for me. So it works the same everywhere. And of course, all the points for making code checks at all also valid for automated code checks. So now, why we would like to write some custom code checks? So it's not some standard one that Python developers or other developers developed. It's something that we want to have locally. So first of all, uh, standards doesn't cover local conventions. Different team may have different conventions, like naming. Maybe somebody wants all functions to start with A, or some have some prefix, whatever. Uh, same goes for good coding practices. Uh, yeah, one popular example is, for example, if you have a class with a method that doesn't take self uh, or KLS, so it might be makes sense to declare it as static. And uh, there is, for example, hacking model from OpenStack. Uh, it basically does the checks and some others. So, but it's not some Python standard. So it, it shouldn't be static, but it usually makes sense. So you need uh, either find some tools that check it or write your own. And overall, if we do unit test, uh, they are specific to your code. And uh, think of it like unit test, but the source code itself. So they are local to your project, and uh, you can do whatever necessary there. Uh, this is just one of the example of uh, what kind of stuff you may want to, to enforce in your code. So uh, imagine you develop a library, and uh, your users, yeah, they just use your library, they call functions, and you want to force them to use uh, keyword arguments. So, so you want to force users to use only the bottom syntax uh, with like object ID equals so this syntax. Uh, there are uh, different um, uh, reasons to do that. Uh, maybe you just like it. So I think personally it's probably more clear and it doesn't depend on position. Uh, there are some valid reasons like for modifiers usually you would like to have this. Uh, just so somebody accidentally won't pass a normal variable there. But uh, it's just example, you may have different. So um, let's see what it takes to develop a automation that will check uh, your code and make sure that all public functions and methods, they force users to use the keyword syntax. So first of all, how to do that? In, in Python 2, Maybe there are some esoteric ways of doing that, but uh, the best way, it's, it's, it's also in books, so just to accept QB arcs. So it's all keyword uh, parameters of the method, and then we basically just pop. If it doesn't exist there, we write type error. So that's common method to enforce it in Python 2. 
uh, when I was doing the talk, I found that Python 3 has newer syntax. So you see the, there is a demand for forcing keywords argument. So if you use this syntax with a star, then everything after this star, Python will force you to pass as keyword arguments. And if it's not happening, then it raises type error. So it's same as the previous code, but just for Python 3. Ideally, we would like to check both with, with the same piece of code, right? So I prepared, yeah, it will be available on, on GitHub. It is, I will show the link to that. So I prepared some code example.py. So this is a file with some sample methods. It doesn't do anything. It just have different declarations, uh, like Python 3 way, Python 2. The wrong ones are the ones on which we want to fail when we check this uh, source code. For example, yeah, it takes arc, so it's positional. And uh, there are also some valid ones, the functions that don't take any uh, parameters. And uh, also, in that code file, I have the same inside the class and just in the model. So because we have to handle this self-argument. Self uh, now there's some, yeah, it's just one scary slide, so we need to know how C Python works. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, I'm kidding, you, you can't know it from one slide, but what you need to know is that uh, when Python works, it basically takes your source code, then inside it does some transformations uh, from the text of source code into some intermediate uh, format, and then essentially it produces byte code that it just runs in its uh, virtual machine. So. Uh, the source code is a text, right? Um, then um, the process called lexing happens, it produces a parse tree. It's basically the same as source code, uh, it's just a set of tokens. Maybe like there is a comma, or it's a quote mark, or it's an identifier, but it's yeah, pretty similar. And what we are interested in here is uh, this thing called abstract syntax tree. It's basically a tree of more logical concepts inside your code, for example, uh, the parse tree will be transformed to it and uh, Python parser will recognize, for example, this is a function definition and an abstract syntax tree will have a class like function definitions and it will have class arguments. So it's pretty useful for those kinds of checks that we are going to do. Uh, there are surely ways to check on other levels. I didn't do that. Uh, so if you know how, the f I'm waiting for your talk. Uh, Okay, so there are algorithms defined in the books, so we can use them, but yeah, don't be scary because, yeah, because we can fly, right? So we just do import anti-gravity and uh, we, are, we are flying, so it's, it's Python. And of course it has uh, batteries inside, uh, so batteries included and there is this uh, AST model. It's uh, just for that, for abstract syntax tree, so it's uh, built in in Python standard library. And we can use it to, to work with uh, syntax trees. So basically here is a small example. So AST parse accepts the text, the text of your source code. So here A1 plus one. And then AST dump just uh, uh, dumps the tree into the text that we can read. So uh, as you see, just yeah, if you do that, we have some, yeah, it's not, not very clear, so just some Python objects and whatever. So, I just rewrote it for you in, in the graph. So it's a tree. Uh, so in this model, all the logical concepts of Python, they are represented on classes, and then there is tree is composite of the, the instances, and they link to each other. So it's normal tree, you see the model is a model, it's body attribute uh, links to the assignment operator, then it has the name, and name is just yeah, the name A, and store is just function to store it. Yeah, and the value is another, so binary operator, it has numbers. Uh, so this is how abstract syntax tree looks like. In order to do our task, we need to check how function definition will look in that AST. So actually, it's written in special formal format. You can probably read it, but what I found is just easier to use a dump function and just see yourself how, how it will look like. So what I did is just I dumped our code example and uh, you will see basically, um, yeah, some simplification I made is that model, it uh, links to a list of everything that is inside your source code and then it basically recognizes all the concepts. The first one is not interesting for us, it's just a, a comment, a doc string at the beginning of the file, but then it immediately comes function definition, so you have it has a class, function def, 
It has its arguments uh, like name, it's just the name of the function, and it has arcs, it's uh, arguments. And you see our arguments are represented by another object. So let's start with some simple stuff. So let's just write some code that will find all function definitions in the, our source code uh, using this AST model that are of interest to us. Uh, so, yeah, so just a bit enlarged one. So we are going to look for this function def uh, instances of this class, and then we will be able to use the name. It's just the name of the function that is defined in source code, and uh, we will then access its arguments in arcs. Um, so this is how this might look like. So let's just go one by one. So we just open the file just as a text file for reading, and then we use this AST parse that I already showed to you, and it will output this AST tree in data structure, and we might just traverse it ourselves if we know how to traverse graphs, uh, but uh, uh, this model provides a AST walk function. It basically will be iterating over the tree and returning all the nodes from it, uh, and one important stuff that for this AST walk, the order in which it returns uh, nodes are, is not warranted. So if you want to depend on some particular order to some state, you might check some node visitor classes inside that model. You can subclass them and they implement just graph traversal algorithm uh, that uh, warrants the order. But if you just work with nodes and it's enough for you, AST walk is the simplest one. So here we just iterate over all the nodes. Uh, then let's, yeah, we may have other, so that is not function definition. So since this model defines all the classes, so we can check if the node that we get is function definition or not. If not, we just uh, continue. We are not interested in that. And then, yeah, we are not interested in private and protected uh, methods, so we just check for public ones. So then we basically just filter everything with underscore I know it will filter constructors. You can add the if and check for them. Else, it might be not ideal, but it's is our check. It's just for our project. If it works for us, we are not going to just write some general checks and publish it. So it's it's fine. So after that, basically, we will should have all function definitions that are public. Okay, so. Uh, we did that, but uh, not ideal thing was that we just opened the, the file for reading and we're now about to write something that will go over all files in your project and just uh, will call our code for all of them. So we can write it in Python, it's not hard, but we can use uh, what is already available in Python ecosystem, right? So the Flake 8 tool is a quite popular code checker that basically integrates with others. And what I found, it's, it's quite easy to extend it and write your own plugin that Flake will just uh, use. And then Flake will uh, read all the source files, it will provide you AST that you will work with, and yeah, it filter uh, all the Python files. So what we have, uh, yeah, we'll see it in the GitHub, so FooBear is just our project, it has some code, in this case it's code example. Then I just put our checks inside, so Flakes is the model that will have our code checker, it's just is in initpy model. We will set in the configuration what to call, and yes, setup is just setup tools, and Toxin is, uh, Tox is virtual inf manager that I just used to, to build and run all this. So. There is a debate if you put the test code inside your project or not, so I just put it, but it, it can be anywhere as soon as it's on a Python pass, so these flakes. Um, this is what a Flake plugin might look like. Uh, basically, all the plugins are expected to be classes, um, and yeah, in Flake 3 you should save the name and version, so it will fail if you don't have it. So I did, and then yeah, in the constructor, you expect to declare what you need. It's same, a bit like PyTest, so basically Flake introspects your constructor, it checks what uh, parameters it accepts, and if you see three there, then it knows that you ask Flake to provide you this uh, AST. If you like specify file name here, it will give you file name. So the thing is that, yeah, it will look into the constructor and provide what you need, so it's just, a convention and it's uh, what it can provide you declared in the documentation. 
So here we're interested in the abstract syntax tree, so we just uh, request it and save. And then for each file, Flake will call your run method, and it's expected to be a generator that yields uh, all the failures that you found there. Uh, yeah, one thing is how Flakes knows what to call. For that, a uh, pretty common concept called entry points uh, is used. Uh, it's a setup tools feature. Basically, it allows you to register your models uh, during installation under some specific names. Um, so, first of all, here we have two packages. It's Fubar is our project, and Fubar Flakes is our plugin. It's our code checker. So we basically ask setup tools to, to install them. And then what we do is that we define these entry points, Flake A extension. Yeah, it's, it's just Flake format, so it's uh, the code, uh, error code that we will use, and it's just uh, passed to the model and the class inside it. So uh, it will be in Python pass because we use uh, stocks and it calls setup tools, and it basically sets everything up into your virtual env, and then Flake will find in there. Uh, so how it works is that, yeah, setup tools register this entry point, and then when Flake starts, it just calls uh, setup tools, actually PKG resources, and says, okay, give me uh, the content of this uh, Flake 8 extension entry point, and this is how it will load your class. Okay, this is just uh, the same code. We just put it inside the right run method. So the only difference here, instead of reading files, we just take this self tree, uh, then Flake will, will make sure that there is an AST of the current file. Then, yeah, everything's the same, and then we use node args to, to work with this arguments uh, object that is just the function arguments. Uh, okay, let's continue. So we need to check how different function arguments look in AST. I, I also yeah, didn't read the documentation, I just looked <laughs> into actual samples. Yeah, just a bit of disclaimer. This is from Python programming fuck you. So uh, it's actually parameters are the ones that you write in the definition and the arguments are what you actually pass when you call a function. This is kind of formal stuff, but here it's uh, the classes arguments and it has uh, attributes args, uh, var args, so I just call it arguments. So as soon as we all understand what we're talking about, that should be fine. Uh, okay, so. This arguments class um, is a safety node that represents the argument that your function takes. And since there are different ways of how you would pass it to Python uh, function, there are different uh, attributes. Depending on how you did that, uh, they will be also set or not. Uh, here we even don't need to care what is inside because that's the magic of AST. It just works on some logical concept and it basically does all the separation of different kind of arguments for you. And we'll basically just have to check uh, uh, how it goes. So, so arc is just normal, like positional arguments. So for example, if you just call this with param, then arcs will, will have some data structure showing that, that you did it. So variable is what follows the star. So it's a variable number of arguments. And if you use this syntax, then this var arc attribute of arguments will be set with the details of, of which variables you used. But yeah, we just basically need to check that it's not empty. And yeah, this is this Python 3 features. It's not in Python 2 AST, but yeah, for keyword only arguments, it will populate this kiwi only args attribute. And yeah, if you use a star, but if in Python 2, you just uh, won't, won't have anything there. Uh, and um, kiwi arc is what follows the two star syntax. So if you define that uh, star star kiwi arcs, then in abstract syntax tree, you will have this uh, details of what variable you use there. And uh, yeah, there are defaults. So if, if you use just uh, regular like param syntax, but equals something, then it, 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 it's the same positional arguments, it's just defaults attribute will be set to the details of what defaults you provided. So the idea for our check is very simple, thanks to this uh, abstract tree. So basically, the idea is just to check for everything that we know to be wrong. This also will make sure that we are not fail uh, falsely. So positional arguments are not okay, this is not what we want. And variable arguments are not okay. 
because it's they are not keyword. Every other is keyword arguments and uh, they look okay for us. So let's just filter out the first two. And it's it's, it's a bit harder due to the method. Uh, so basically we should somehow handle the self uh, if it's inside the class. So this is the code that works with arguments and just does the check we want. So first let's check for positional arguments. So if we have some positional arguments in our definition, uh, then so first of all, if there are more than one of them, it's clearly that uh, we pass some positional arguments because in, in, in class methods you, you will have at least self uh, or KLS, but yeah, if there are more than one, then we, we can fail. So we are yielding a failure. I will show the failure function a bit later. Uh, then, yeah, just a special case, if we have only one argument, we may be inside the class. Since we are not doing this uh, context-dependent checking, we just do it simple. If it's the first argument is not self or KLS, uh, then we, we think that something went wrong. Uh, in theory, they may be named differently, but this is our local check, and uh, if you name <laughs> your first arguments of methods inside the class like all people do, then you would probably use self and KLS, so we don't really need to write some very general checkers. It's, if it works for your project, then it's fine. So we can just yield if it, it's not in the allowed list. And only then we have this case left to check with variable arguments. So basically, if we set something in variable arguments, we just, again, yield a failure. Uh, this is how failure uh, function uh, looks like. Actually, it looks to be changed over Flake 2 and Flake 3, but in Flakes, inside source code, you will find the examples uh, directory, and inside there, there are some simple examples of plugins. This is actually how I know what to, what to return as a failure. So it's expect a tuple. Uh, first is the line number, then the, the, the position inside the line. And we just take it from abstract syntax tree because it just keeps all the positions there, so we don't, don't need to deal with that. Then we just provide the error text uh, that we want to pass, and uh, then for some reason we need to pass also the name of the checker. Uh, I really don't know why, but it's the same as in the example. So, yeah, this will yield the failure. And, uh, uh, one note that um, I want to emphasize that it's very custom, so you may have some fun. For example, if, if, if you want uh, function definition to not be in place between lines 4 and 42, you are free to check that. I don't know, maybe it's not lucky numbers. And uh, as a like, uh, development leader, you want to force them not to be defined there. So it's very strange check, but it's custom, so it's, if you want that, you can do that, and I encourage you to do that if you have that convention. And since you are not really publishing it outside of your source code, it's, it's up to you, so nobody will be complaining why you have it in like PyPy or like on a GitHub, it's, it's inside your project, so it's your custom checks. Uh, you can do some more meaningful stuff, for example, as I said, Flake introspects your constructor, and here besides AST, we ask Flake to also pass us the name of the file that we are checking, and we save it, and then we can use it in run function. For example, this will yield this failure only if we uh, inside this important don't pi. So as you see that you can just uh, pretty much uh, code your conventions tied to specific places in your code, if you need that. Okay, so now just I executed it uh, just running talks inside the folder, so we get this failure. It looks like normal flake failure because it's just <laughs> using flake. And uh, this is our message text. Yeah, I just go went ahead and I check that all the slide numbers are pointing to wrong function. So in that sense, it, it's correct. Uh, yeah, but if it doesn't, then it's okay because it's inside your source code. You just uh, ch change the checks uh, along with your commit. Same as you, for example, if your unit test fail, you will include uh, the, the fixes into the same commit. So it's pretty similar. You can adjust the, the checks and it's uh, how that works. Uh, yeah, just um, since there are a lot of moving parts, so let's just recap. So when we did that, what actually happened? 
So we used it at talks, and it created the virtual environment uh, for you, and then it's you call setup tools. And setup tools, as we requested, it installed inside the FUBAR, it's our project. And also we requested to install FUBAR Flex. This is our code checker. So it's installed inside the setup tools, installed it inside the talks environment. And then, uh, since we requested an entry point, uh, setup tools also re registered our plugin as an entry point. And then Tox was configured. I didn't show the configuration file, but you can find it on GitHub. So Tox uh, basically uh, calls Flake 8, and then it calls PKG resources. This is part of setup tools, and says, OK, please give me all the classes that are registered for that entry point. And this is how it finds our plugin. And since uh, we use setup tools and Tox, uh, it's warranted to be on Python path, so we don't need to adjust it. And then basically, Flake 8 calls our plugin from that entry point, then, yeah, checks our constructor, takes the parameters, realizes, okay, so we need a syntax tree, so let's use the AST model probably to, to give them syntax tree. If you request something else, it'll give us, and then just wait for our failures and include them along with the other. So uh, you can also call these talks from IDE, so it's, yeah, it it's works same as unit test. So, okay, yeah. Uh, let's have some conclusions. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's possible to write uh, custom code checks. You, you saw that it's, it's very easy. If, if you use the built-in tools and models, then uh, it's, it's just very easy. And uh, you, you see that it's quite enough abstract from specific syntax because we are not parsing any spaces. We are not using regex. So if you want to work with this code, uh, logical constructs, you can use AST, it's abstract, and also we did a check that works for Python 2 and Python 3 with, with, with not much hassle due to AST. Uh, yeah, we can include it just inside our source code, so it's our business, we are not publishing this as some general model, it's just for us, and if somebody complains, then it's it. And yeah, we can, we can run it along with other checks um, using standard build and run tools that you have in Python. Yeah, there are also references at the end of my presentation to the documentation and some books. Uh, you may like to read them. And yeah, feel free to send also questions to my Twitter, email, and this talk along with slides is available on, on GitHub. Okay, so we have time for questions. Yes, uh, so this, this yeah, the, the question was, so we are not really checking the calls uh, uh, that we do to this method. Yeah, that was the reason for the check. So we are checking that our API forces user to, to, to have keywords. Mm. So I don't know if there is a support for any type inference. So basically everything that in IST, you can check for that. Uh, if it doesn't work for you, then uh, there should be possible to check on other levels in the code, but I, I didn't try that. So basically, yeah, those, those checks, it, it's you are bound to what is defined inside this AST, so what's concept. Okay, we are probably out of time, so yeah, ping me on Twitter if you yeah, come up with any questions. Thank you, bye.